everyone, and welcome to the Jeff Willis Show. Today I have with me the Bagel Bunnies. That's what I'm going to call them. Uh, oh, I did that. Where's James Bond? That'd be a Bagel Bunny. <laughs> <laughs> so we have Joan Canner and Michelle Bond, who are the co-founders of Bottom Up Bagels. And we could go a lot of different ways with that name, but we're not going to. So before co-founding Bottoms Up Bagels, also known as Bub, Joan had a 15 year career in academia that included social science research and detailed heavy fire hose act grants and contracts administration. She also created the music streaming app Fugue, which would suggest to me that they like music that lets you hear what you want and forget what you don't. Um, so now they have started bagels because they went to a crap breakfast at a corporation and everyone hated their breakfast and they went, we can do better than this. And consequently, Bubs was born. Welcome to the show, ladies. It's an absolute pleasure to have you here. And can you identify yourselves? Because I just see you collectively as Joan, really, at this stage on my screen. So, Oh, for sure. So I am Joan Canner. So if you guys like a little bit of vocal fry, I'm your woman. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm Michelle Bond. Okay. And she's the sister of James Bond. And uh, that's really cool. And uh, she's also a friend of Patrick Quinn, who introduced... Uh, that's right. to me and there's a story about what they did at college we're not going to go there either <laughs> so. <laughs> no we don't have enough time for that there were no smartphones back then is that correct michelle yeah <laughs> oh thank yep. god Oof. did they have smartphones when you went to college no 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 we're all better off well i mean you and i would win be interested in that story jeff but they yeah. don't want that out in the world <laughs> well, well when i went to college there wasn't even the internet so that's how old i am so it's yeah, and, we were on the cusp. So yeah, are oh, you on the cusp? Okay, I wasn't even near the cusp. I was more in the. <laughs> <up>. <laughs> okay, so we're going to talk about all things bagels and how this all started, and uh, we're going to see what the call was to go from being anonymous to being bagel moguls, and right. we want to hear a lot more about that. So, ladies, tell us. Was this a, a drunk evening at a sports bar somewhere that you came up with the idea? How did this bagel business start? That's more of like the Hemingway approach, right? Like get really drunk and start writing. <laughs> Pee at the side of a boat. That's mostly like how I write our commercials. You got like towed out to sea by a bagel. Okay, right. <laughs> Just like, you know what I mean? Like there's other types of energy with that. But we, I think like, like other entrepreneurs, like we just saw a massive need for the product that we make and that we grew up loving. Right. Yeah. And we had, um, we were both in other careers, as you alluded to in the intro, and we had, had gone 10 dozen, 10 or a dozen years without having what we knew to be a bagel, a chewy, you know, uh, little bit of crunch on the outside, full flavor, um, treat that was not only the food itself, but the kind of culture around it being from mm -hmm. the Northeast originally. And so we had been in a bunch of breakfast meetings where we saw, uh, even if people liked what was in front of them, they had an opinion on it, which was also valuable. Oh, this, well, this isn't as good as that place. That place isn't as good as that place, you know? And so, um, so that's one piece of it. The other piece was that we were always looking for, uh, we had this dream of having a food business. And so um, we were foodies, you know, spent a lot of our time. And at that point, money going out to eat, following trends, doing that kind of stuff. Um, but we kind of felt a little bit lost and taken for granted as consumers, as, as food diners. And mm -hmm. so the first thing that we did was set out to see if other people felt the way that we did. So about, we created- About bagels? about um about what was mo missing in the food scene to start right okay so we separately had this feeling about bagels but but we were kind of generally looking for eating trends among people in our area and so right. we put together a survey joan has a survey and grants administration background i have a marketing and community development background and so um we kind of brought those things together and uh, just started asking, you know, putting the survey out online, taking ads in the local paper, going to uh, farmers markets to see what people were missing, what people, what kinds of foods they they thought that they uh, might like to see in the area, what kind of price points they were looking for, 
the way that they actually dined out, all of those things. Mm. And that started to give a little bit of backbone to this idea that having a quality, inexpensive, but filling option, uh, which w- is what we see bagels to be, <laughs> um, was, was uh, we were onto something there. So so you did research and what did the research show that there was um, that the food wall was one sh- one bagel short of a full wall? Was that really what it was? <laughs> oh, I love that. We're going to totally use that. Credit you, of course, is always attribution is very important coming from the research world. But like there's so much stuff that we learned. We're asking also about like star chef bullshit culture. Like at that point, you had people who were like lower, like lowercase, like S star uh, chefs in our area saying like I know you want you guys want communal tables like hell do I want a communal table you know what I mean like but like that's the kind of stuff that was happening so we also want to ask about those behaviors and, and things things like do people like really noisy restaurants does it matter where you're eating if it's going to be like a like a white tablecloth restaurant do you want to make sure it's going to be quieter and be more about ambiance so we got that info as well, although Lord knows, like bagels really aren't like a white tablecloth kind of thing. But people uh, kind of want, they, they did like want bagels, but they also want stuff we have a shit ton of, which is also a unit of measurement in case you were wondering that we use in the States. But there's there's <laughs> yeah, so shit many, ton. A shit ton. That, yeah, that very scientific term, a shitload of stuff, right? Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah 100%. Yeah. So they like for things like, in, there's so many like pizzerias like all over this part of the world, but like people can't get enough like, you know, pizza, they want something better. So I think bagels are that thing that are ubiquitous, at least in the States. And they have some decent places by you. So I've heard through the internet, but they don't, it's hard to find something that really matches up what you're looking for. Mm-hmm. I think that was something that came through in the survey results as well. Right. So did the research show that instead of a communal table, you really needed a small bagel booth, something like that. So you could have intimate bagel conversations with your own bagel. Does that, <laughs> that come up? A better way to eat it in your car alone while listening to your podcast with t- very tinted windows to so not see how you eat like Cookie Monster, yeah, which is very, how very I eat generally. Windows, yeah. <laughs> yeah, very, very dark windows and like, and just have uh, access to getting your car cleaned regularly for all the everything seeds in, the things <laughs> in your car. I mean, I think the, the main thing was that, you know, and we've always, it's been, it's been a tough line to toe for us too, because it's a handmade product. Um, it's crafted, but there's nothing pretentious about it. No. And that's the kind of stuff that was coming up, which is like, you know, we're missing, there's a huge gap between white tablecloth and takeout. And yes. and that's what people were looking for. And so that really kind of hit our sweet spot because we wanted to create something that, you know, I mean, the bagels themselves are handmade, but then the sandwiches that we're putting together, they're made to order and, you know, and at the same, and you have people who are, connected to the community and who know you and all that kind of stuff. Um, but it's not out of your price range. You can do it a few times a week. Um, you can also do it and be full for until your next meal, you know? So that's the, those are the kind of threads that we pulled out of there. Okay. So you've, you've had the call as we call in the hero's journey to (laughs) start a bagel business after doing the, doing the research. So, what happened next in that you're going, okay, we're just going to go to markets and do the hard work at, uh, you know, basically, I suppose, you know, knocking doors down, testing people at markets. Um, the hard graft, in other words, before you, you know, launch a full bricks and mortar store, is that what happened? It is, yeah. So we had, we had grown, um, you know, we started in our home. Um, we started doing farmers markets in the area we quickly had enough demand where we wanted to also do catering and sell direct to consumers under the laws here you can't do that unless you're in a licensed facility not to mention like depending on what's on your menu um if you're doing locks or something like like we were as well you know house made salmon needs to be in a controlled environment can't be in our house so um so we we really based the biz- the first phase of the business around that model of, of doing pop-ups. So right. pop-ups in farmer's markets with breweries and art galleries in, um, oh my God, at bike races, at co- outdoor concerts. I mean, we did, you know, that was the model for the first four plus years. 
Yeah. And we and we developed quite a following that way. And then we were also doing wholesale to local cafes and restaurants and um, the catering for, for different customers, both institutions and individuals. Right. So was there a... So you did get a... Went back to the 1940s, I believe, to get the, a recipe for a bagel. Is that correct? Or did we go back further than that? I think we had to both travel through time, but also a parallel universe. <laughs> um, I have to say that I did patent the technology. So sorry, Cool Cats. Um, I, that was mine. Because I want to not just go back to the 40s. I want to go back to the 40s where women were working in these roles, almost like a league of their own, like playing baseball and doing having other jobs um, and creating and, stuff. Because like, and, building and building ammunition for the war. That's what they're also doing, I think. Yeah. Building ammunition, um, and and this, but in this case, we never go back to not working <laughs> in that parallel universe. I mean, trust me, I, I love putting women back in the kitchen. That's what we have <laughs> with our business. It's very radical. It's like radical that, feminist it, right there. Is Take that, that Harvey. Is that in your mission statement? Get women back in the kitchen. Is that right? Yeah, that's just so we can get investment. You know what I mean? I don't really mean it that way. <laughs> yeah. but the people who got the money believe in that. So. <laughs> Um, and by the way, uh, listeners and viewers, this is actually humour. By the way, this is not serious. Yeah, about yeah, right. You're right. because so, um, uh, some people don't get irony, and uh, you know, so it's okay. We're we're joking. All right, about putting women back in the kitchen. We actually right. want them out of the kitchen making bagels in factories. Really, that's what we really want to do. Isn't <laughs> that's right. <laughs> that and ammunition, but don't get them twisted. Well, mix them up. A, a very hard bagel can be ammunition, by the way, I've heard. That is true. Ours are of that type. I mean, <laughs> it's a good job work. By day three or four, you don't want to be, yeah. But you don't like, have to be preservatives, that's what, that's what I'm saying. You know, though, that's the, but that's the old school. I mean, <laughs> our, our we, we did start with an original New York, New York bagel recipe, but the, the 1940s part of our story is that it's the places that we grew up going to that in Northern right. New Jersey that inspired this idea of, um, or not even this idea what we missed, which was not only the bagel itself, but all of the activity around it. You know, yeah. the person yelling at the person um, in the back who had the mixer going, racks of, of baked, you know, goods going in front of your face while, while there's a line out the door, the, the smell of the, of the onion and garlic coming out of that bag when you picked it up, like all of those things were really part of um, what we missed and what we wanted to try to recreate. Yeah. Look at the, like, like Diego Rivera, like a huge mural, only instead of like other machinery, they were making bagels. You know, okay. I went to a factory and they were open 24 hours. The yeah, place I used can, to go to. And you can run tour, bagel tours. That would be fantastic. And, mm -hmm. but the thing, the thing about food for me, Okay, I wouldn't call myself really a foodie, but I do love food. But I also like the ambience of the food eating. Okay, and that usually involves both the people and the environment. And I remember going to a fantastic, well, one of the best restaurants in Italy, apparently, I was told in um, uh, when I went to speak there for the first time on the other side of the world a long time ago, uh, when Adam and Eve had just been created. And the reality. <laughs> Still you were out there. Philip was still alive. That's right, and so pinching cheeks and <laughs> yeah, that's right, and and fondling supermodels. Um, so <laughs> right, <laughs> and now we're not joking. That's true. <laughs> that's true. Yeah, sorry, sorry, Bellasconi, we you're turning in your grave. Um, <laughs> but I went to a lovely restaurant, supposedly the best food, but it was the ambience was like a laundromat. It had uh, it had fluorescent lighting. It was so bright, and we had a you know the the football playing on the big screen down the corner and supposedly it was the best food in town. And, uh, yeah, I don't like eating in laundromats. It's just got the ambience of a really mass produced factory and I really didn't like it. So let me tell us about, you know, you were talking about going back to the old times and about, you know, enjoying people out the door and, you know, arguments in the kitchen and, uh, you know, a bit of dwarf tossing maybe occasionally thrown in, uh, which is inappropriate and joke, by the way. The, the little people. They're, they're little people. <laughs> that's right, the little people. That's right. Which yeah. I, I would almost fit into, really, if I was stood next to LeBron James, really. I would be seen as a dwarf next to him. But I think we're frozen here. <laughs> Are we he, back? Okay. Right, frozen. <laughs> 
Have we got internet here? Right. That's stable. Perhaps I'm unstable. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> oh, we're back. We're back. Okay, right. We're back. Even okay. better. Where, where were we? Uh, sh- small people tossing. That's what we're talking about. Ambiance. Right. Ambiance. Yeah, sorry. Ambiance of the restaurant. Tell us about the ambiance of your bagel store restaurant. What does it look like? Can you describe it? I, I will start by saying that it's very important for us not to have any hidden labor, meaning t- traditionally you have in a restaurant and even some bakeries, a front of the house, so people who take your order, they hand off your order to you, um, they give you the coffee, what have you. And there's the back of the house, the people that produce, you know, the egg sandwiches who pr- like work on the dough itself, who are like washing the dishes. And when we design the space, we want to make sure that our shop and any future shops would, would not have that division. Yep. You may in terms of labor, you know, in terms of like the zones that people play, I guess using like a, a football soccer reference <laughs> where you play, you might play zone or play man, right? So um, just I'm to make sure we keep our listeners along too, to explain yes. what you're talking about. Yeah. Um, uh, so like by having, and also by having like not a front of the house and back in the house, it's just simply how she work as a, a different team dynamic. And you make sure that tip splitting is also more equitable. You get to see uh, it's more authentic by nature seeing us. If you see a 60 quart mixer, and you're still going to ask me, do you make the bagels here? That's on you, man. <laughs> this is not for show. No one's buying like a 60 quart Hobart just to like show it off. Like, hey, yeah. you know, this is what I have. So that yeah. was like the first bit of like, of, of ambiance or, or scene set, <laughs> setting. Yeah, very, um, we looked a long time for uh, this particular place because it it was more of a rectangular shape. You know, being in, in a city like Baltimore, most of the, available properties that we were looking at um, at that time to rent were row houses. So, you know, front to back, which made it pretty difficult to to realize this concept that we wanted to, where you could kind of see everything before your eyes as you walked in. And so yep. um, the place that we ended up um, building out was a, a perfect rectangle, so to speak, and, and huge windows where, um, as Joan said, you know, there was a counter, but all the production was going on right behind the counter. And there's um, uh, seating at the counter and seating in the windows uh, was the was the goal. Um, you know, unfortunately, COVID kind of had those seats empty most of the whole time that we were there. But <laughs> that was the intention. But the windows, though, it was always like a trans. People, when they're waiting for their order, can like look inside and see all the inner workings. Cool. Mm-hmm. So, so you've got this, you got sort of desks, well, not desks, but uh, tables, and you've got also yeah. you can sit up at the bar. Is that right? Like, um, okay. Yeah, that's the idea. That was the idea. Um, right. And then along the wall under the hood, you know, you've got the flat top and the ovens and the, and the kettle boiler and all that stuff working as well. So, yeah. yeah, I quite, I quite like, you know, the long sort of uh, bar approach where you, because the, the reality is that, tables are for couples really not for single people right so mm-hmm. uh, if you want to sit and bump into someone in your especially if you travel at a traveler for example right you can sit up at a bar and bump into people and end up having conversation which is rather nice um whereas if you just sit on your own at a table it looks a bit lonely it looks like you're a loser really doesn't it so uh, <laughs> you're hard to approach in that way I mean, yeah, it's okay but, if you want to be like left alone, but you know, I have no idea how many people like left books behind or pull down hats at the shop. Right. Yeah. 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 And we had mostly people outside. So because of COVID, so, you know, same thing we did. We, yeah, we didn't have the, a bar outside. We had, you know, two tops and four tops and um, you're right in that. I mean, when we travel, it's the same. We always sit at the bar, even yeah. when it's two of us for, for that same, you know, for, to, to get that same kind of, uh, experience of just connecting with random people and, and yeah. taking all in what's going on yeah well, it's, and it's great you know so uh, i have my favorite places in san francisco that i go to where i consider them are and i've ended up having the most fascinating conversations and um that's the fun one of the fun parts of traveling is meeting new people that speak another language such as you know american english english uh, that's, yeah. please don't even part of like our baking <laughs> honestly jeff you hit on such a nerve because like i remember <laughs> There's a, there's a fantastic group called Bakers for Bakers. They're out of uh, Canada, our neighbors to the north. It is a different language. So oh, they had a, a really brilliant session uh, about like really it's a marketing adjacent session, right? Not as brilliant as this conversation, but still fairly brilliant 
Uh, there's an exchange rate in terms of brilliance between the U.S. and there, which is fine. So <laughs> they did the transcript, and I just I just wrote in the in the those the chat, and I was just like, "Will this be translated to American English?" <laughs> and like, it was just such a moment. But it is true. There but were they, certain yeah. I mean, they got they were, they were joking, obviously, but yeah, yeah, it was pretty funny. Yeah, I'm well. I'm I'm going to raise something that was one of my secret tactics when I started my blog in 2009, mm -hmm. is that I didn't want the Americans to know I was actually Australian, right? <gasps> so I what did you say? Very, I was very naughty. I I used American English spelling and uh, oh god. And when I bumped into people on the other side of the world, they're going, "Oh my god, you're not from America." And I went, "No." So it was my secret. <laughs> That was my secret source to actually to it was my front line to break into the american market was to actually write in american english it, and it worked yeah of course. Sure, that's the same thing that keith urban did and i bet that jeff knows keith urban <laughs> that's oh, true. Yeah, yeah keith and our neighbors yeah so but uh <laughs> but, anyway. but um so you create this ambience but you've done all the hard yards you've you know basically knock down doors by going to markets. In other words, you, you're basically really grafting on the ground, I suppose, not like not an online business. You find what works and what doesn't more. Um, and then what did you discover also? What is the top bagels? And I'm sure smoked salmon, cream cheese, capers, bagel would be one of your top sellers. Would that be correct? Yes, probably the top seller. We called it a locked up. All right, you call it a lock. Yeah. You call it a, a lock, locked up. Okay, cool. Yeah. Right. Um, so yeah, because other... we cured our salmon in house too. So I mean, it yeah. was people. We also sold it by the quarter pound and half pound and and, and stuff like that. Right. So uh, basically, you open your store. You found the right store. Went looking for it to get you wanted the right. You wanted to basically get the best ambience so that people could really enjoy the food front of house, back of house, all visible. Uh, and then something happened, isn't it? I think called COVID. Is that correct? <laughs> right, stuff happened before COVID, but I think before we go forward, I want to make sure that you don't lose too many listeners. I too enjoy capers, okay? But it's a very controversial thing to add to a sandwich. Really? So dear listeners, <laughs> at least here. we are pro caper. Jeff is clearly pro caper. Doesn't mean that we will not, we will not force you force them upon you should you order from us just want to put that out there okay right i i think uh i do love a good caper and i'm not talking the edible caper i love a good caper right a good adventure a good adventure a good uh like, that's like the muffin sinister uh yeah situation <laughs> but but we will talk about the roadshow which happened before and after covid <laughs> yeah for sure um and i will say just on your question about toppings i mean yeah. we had the other thing is um there are several bagel shops who only focus also on like the cream cheese and the salmon and because that's that's in some cases all you need um but given where we grew up in northern jersey we also wanted that you know those gooey eggs egg and meat sandwiches so we also made a mid sausage in house both spicy and and wow. uh, sweet sweet and uh all kinds of egg sandwiches all kind of make mixed cream cheeses with different uh, flavors and and with different combinations of egg and uh, on with cream cheese and, you know, arugula and all that kind of stuff. So um, we did a fairly extensive menu and, and a lot of specials that we also did. Um, so yes. And then um, as you say, we, we kind of, we, we got to the point where we were um, striving for all those early years, the brick and mortar. And um, despite it even being COVID, we, we were getting into a groove and wanted to, resume something that we had begun uh, in 2019 called the Bub Roadshow, which was uh, already thinking about market expansion. We wanted to take our products and our brand really on the road and, right. and see if it resonated in places that we thought might be a good fit for the business. Right. Um, so we started that in 2019, took a little break in, well, 20, of course 20 break. COVID. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and then, uh, picked it up in 2021. Well, we started in Bozeman, Montana. So for the for the three to four people- You started in Bozeman, listening, Montana, did you? I, we did because like we, we were dealing with the elements, like literally elevation. So for anyone who's listening, who is a home baker, who uses yeasted doughs or, or makes that for themselves, when I tell you that where we're from, New Jersey is sea level, sometimes below sea level, 
where um, we are in Maryland, not too much like above sea level. To go from that and with Michelle's speaking experience and knowledge, you'd be able to like make our recipe work when you're so many thousand feet up was also an accomplishment because you can't just, you know, not gonna like make stuff where you are and ship it out. You wanna make it locally to be fresh. Yes, yeah. So you so you really started making these in Bozeman, Montana? Well, we didn't start them there, but that was the first stop on the road show. Oh, right. So, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, so well, I, we were okay. a few years in and then decided to make it even harder. <laughs> and Make it even harder. And you discovered the uh, effects of elevation and lack of oxygen in terms of getting things to rise. Yeah. Well, it's kind of the opposite, actually. It, it accelerates. <laughs> getting things not to rise. Okay. It accelerates. No, accelerates it. The, the yeast production. So, okay. um, yeah. But, um, but the, the other the box of brownie mix or a type of like baking mix, look on the side and there should be something for higher elevation. I kid you not. Oh. Okay, with I wouldn't have crossed my mind. I, I was actually in Bozeman, Montana, in two thousand nineteen. Was that when you were running your roadshow? Yeah, it was. Were you? God, was it? Was it? Did um, she buy that much? <laughs> yeah. I love that. I that much. Yeah. It, it was. It was. I was. I was actually. Uh, I'd flown to a uh, influencer conference to a dude ranch in uh, Montana, uh, and uh, got picked up in a big black SUV with dark yeah. windows. Yeah. Oh, uh, yep. Yeah, uh, Bose Angeles. <laughs> Bose Angeles. That's what it's zing. It's <laughs> damn, Michelle. It's your cold. That's that's uh, no, I mean, it's that's what was happening. Even, yeah, yeah, that's very cool. Okay, right. Well, we missed, did miss each other. So it's a shame because I, I yeah. was I was looking for a bagel at the time. So, um, oh, goodness, it wasn't November, was it? Then we would really feel that. Uh, no, no, it wasn't a bagel blizzard time. Um, so. Okay. <laughs> Right. You know what? It's really interesting that bagels seem to lend themselves to a lot of alliteration. I think that's really, I don't know why, but it does. Yeah, it's, you're right. A lot of things start with B. Yeah. Well, yeah. Bond. I mean, even the business name, <laughs> bottoms up. I mean, we met, that's more of like a, che a cheers, you know? Um, that's the spirit in which Bolts. we meet. Balls. Yes. <laughs> there you go. Okay. Bolts. So tell us more about the roadshow, uh, apart from. Um, Bose, Bose Vegas? No, Bose Angeles. Uh, Bose, Los Bose Angeles. Yeah, you got it. You got it. <laughs> well, again, like we were still like operating stuff in Baltimore um, for the pandemic, but as things like lifted and people got their shots, we were vaxxed and waxed and like ready to go out <laughs> in the world. <laughs> ready out in the world, Jeff. Because like for us, you know, like I don't have like, um, you know, family not money or, or where I went to like grad school doesn't have like a huge network. I knew that for us to be able to like prove ourselves as a concept, we would probably have to do something that's unconventional, yes. but also like, but it made like business sense, you know? So we ended up having, going to enough places between um, 2021 and last September where you know, I have a back of a tour shirt. The front's like an all like really cool design by a local uh, artist. And the back is nothing but cities that we have been to and produced. Oh. Mm -hmm. And it's always, it's, it's, it's just like, a, it's like, it's a mess sometimes. So be able to take something that's so fucking hard, right? Yeah. And then you end up doing it on the road in different kitchens, different places, and try to recreate the same quality. Right. So, so you would have had to go and find places that had kitchens. Right. Did, did so Bozeman we had a whole had, process. Did Bozeman have kitchens? <laughs> They we only had dude ranches. What do you think? Dude ranches. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> With horses yeah, they, streaming past. I cooked yeah. over a hit. Yeah. <laughs> um, they did have a kitchen. We actually, th there we ended So we looked for also, given my background in community development and Joan's background in like, in, in consume, customer, um, you know, really listening to what customer needs within the marketplace are, um, we really had this kind of partnership approach to everything that we do. And so when entering these different locations, it was really important for us to be additive and to not just be there it's, kind of anonymously sell our product, take money and go on to the next place. Like we really spent a lot of time cultivating um, some sort of relationship, trying to find the best fit. And so in Bozeman, we ended up at a pay what you can restaurant that operated a uh, dinner service that didn't have breakfast and lunch service. Right. And so we rented some of their space and served as their back of the house, making food for breakfast and lunch for the, for the, you know, time that we were there. Right. Um, we've had other places where 
we've gone into more of like a food hall that has a larger kitchen area at one end that they use for uh, cooking classes or something. And we've rented that and been able to be a part of that community for the time that we're there. Other times we go into um, just kind of like a commissary kitchen, like the one that we started out in Baltimore. Um, and But we're always trying to find, in, in, in which case then we'd have to find a partner to sell the bagels at, you know, to, right. to partner with uh, on the retail side. So yeah. and you meet the best people. I mean, for your point about being at the bar, I mean, like to work next to oh, chefs yeah. and staff in different places, you know, people just said like, why can't you just get a food truck and drive around the US? I'm like, because I, number one, I wouldn't have room because like when you need three reaching refrigerators full just for the dough before you get any other stuff that goes on it, that's not really advisable. Yeah. But how would I, like you need to like have the, the conflict and friction and the information that you get by being embedded. And I said this like on our pod, like when you are amongst other people in the large kitchen, they're doing your work, you're like doing, you're doing your work, they're doing their work. They are they are watching you, not saying a word. They wanna see how you work before they come over to talk to you. And right. I do love how in food is just like a show me. It's, it's show me first. Don't tell me what you do. Don't tell me who you are. Yeah, show yeah, me first. I can trust you next. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Because it, as you say, it's not a business, it's so hard, like, it's one of the challenges that we've had is that, you know, network wise, most of the people in our industry are so busy. We've got our heads down. We're like cranking things out. We, we're we not um, a consumer uh, e-commerce business or not to say those those people aren't working very hard, but there there's like all the stuff that's within an e-commerce business or within a service related business, plus then the tangible product that you got to get out the door on a daily basis. Yeah. And so it's been tough to, you know, as we've tried to scale and things like that, really find um, the avenues to um, to really showcase what we can do because we're just busy doing it. Yeah. And in these situations, I think that's very true. It's like everyone is is just passionate about what they're doing and just trying to get it out. And so, yeah, yeah. I'll trust you later. Let me just, while I'm working on my thing over here, kind of have you at the corner of my eye and see what's going on. Yeah. So what a bit... This so obviously there's a lot of challenges with the food business. You mentioned like elevations, one which maybe didn't cross your mind until you found that it wasn't quite not rising as you wanted it to. Um, so what are the other challenges that you had and who helped you along the way a bit? Like was there any advice from master chefs, uh, business, you know, mentors, uh, but what, what were some of the problems and, what were some of the mentors that helped you along the way? I think mechanically a uh, problem that people can probably very easily envision is just like sourcing. When we were doing a month long event in Iowa, it was fantastic. Like a um, bit of like market data, great menu. We hired locally amazing staff, but they were just the, the bits that we couldn't get our arms around. Like how do you not have minced garlic? in a volume that we need. So it was just trying to oh. always chase that. I think that I'm sure many people listening will just understand supply chain issues. You think that they're done. You're like, oh, well, they're inflated, but I'll get it. But sometimes you still can't get those items. Right. Yeah. And in that case, in that particular situation, um, there were other food businesses who were happy to be like, oh, who are you working with? Oh, talk, you know, here's a contact I have at this place. They, they can help you out or they, you know, it, what, explain to them what you're trying to do. And so there's that networking piece for, for I think, the on the ground specifics of just even here in Baltimore, like, you know, when seafood was at a premium during COVID and we obviously need salmon, um, working with different uh, purveyors who are more locally based to try to meet those needs and them understanding what we we're trying to do and really kind of going out of their way to help us. And I think um, always peer to peer. I feel like yeah. our best guidance has always been peer to peer. There's a lot of false idols out there and a lot of false mentors. Yes. Okay. And, That's cool. you know, I, and then the first like couple of years, I feel like we fell prey to some of that because we were just nascent. I forgot, like, for some reason, I walked into a kitchen and I forgot, like, how many years I have worked, you know, and like raised to a certain level and had my, had my master. I just, I just forgot about that. So to your point, Michelle, I think peer to peer has been critical. Yeah. And, and, um, other, I think um, certainly people who we've worked with in an advisor capacity in terms of like, you know, some of our accounting work and oh, yeah. our, and our um, small business development programs. Um, 
I was a part of the Goldman Sachs has a 10,000 small businesses program um, right. in the States. I, I think it's, it might be global. I'm not sure. Not um, yep. But um, that's a, basically a four month program of um, a mixture of classes and mentoring and um, advisement and things like that. And yeah. that was really helpful, not only for the actual knowledge and, and, um, connections, but just for that network, obviously of other, uh, business owners and entrepreneurs, because, yeah. uh, as you probably know, I mean, at the beginning, especially it can be very isolating. You're really trying to figure it all out. You're so focused on your product and your customer that you don't really have time to lift your head up and do the thing you need to be doing, which is, you know, connecting with other business owners who can help make that path a little easier. Yeah. So, yeah. So the other thing that crossed my mind too is uh, you've, en you've engaged in a lot of hand-to-hand -hand combat as in yeah. markets, <laughs> right? Perfect way to put it. Church kitchens where maybe I got into the one and only legitimate probably fight I've ever had with someone. Uh, the church kitchen, it was, a, it was a basement. It was an awesome place to, to, to work out of in Cohoes, New York. But once you know it, Jeff, they were also having like an AA meeting outside of it. And this one woman was fighting me about where she wanted to plug in her coffee pot because quote unquote, addicts need their coffee. And I was just like, who are you telling lady? Cause like, you know, I love it. But that was the only time we've had that friction going back to hand to hand combat and the burns, right? All, all the kitchen tattoos, we call them. The burns are currently uh, covering up all those marks and cuts. Yeah. Well, the hand -hand wanted a question. Yeah. yeah, the hand to hand combat, I'm sort of, physical which turns up when you do this is uh, going to markets <laughs> touring in other words going to you know, all around the states like bozeman in montana and so on and you're really you know you're in the trenches and um so the question i have is how do you scale a bagel how do you scale a bagel business. a bagel or the business <laughs> How do you scale a bagel business? I suppose it's been okay, very. Yes. Okay. But the dough, you cut the dough and you put the bait, you put the you put the dough on the skin. Yeah, that's how you scale it. We <laughs> yeah. yeah. follow that guy. Yeah. It's so, difficult. I, yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, I just want to know is because you ladies are getting your hands dirty, literally not dirty, but doughy. Let's let's call it. You're getting your hands <laughs> doughy. Yeah, yeah. Right, and. Uh, and then on top of that, then how do you scale a bagel business when it's a bricks and mortar store? Of course, there's all different business models for that, such as franchising. So how are you going with the scaling side of things so that you get your hands out of the dough and um, on the road? Yeah, it's really, um, it's tough. It's really dependent on labor. It's very high, um, you know, very high labor costs and, um, that's what made it made it particularly tough. Um, not so much during COVID, but post COVID, when you were having you know that all the COVID fallout and um, the the yeah. whole workforce kind of changing itself up and things like that. Um, you know, so our focus has always been to get a tight operation, and Good then yeah. yeah, and then you know we've been focused on trying to raise funds um, based on you know the track record that we have in terms of knowing our customer and where the how the product has been tested in different places and things like that um, in order to to make that leap but it's tough I mean unless you're going a franchise model or you have an influx of, of capital um, which post covid in the food world you know is less and less unless you are a, a known entity um, yeah. so those those are some of the things that, that, I mean, we're continuing to work through. I mean, the main thing for us is we're really trying to own the property where we produce because we, as we know that that builds wealth and that creates a stable line item where we can at least yeah. then get out of the day to day and, and be on to the next thing. Right. So, so the, what's the, uh, so basically the restaurants is like number of seats that you can do or, uh, how, how big is a rest, restaurant you're in? How many seats? And how many table turns, I suppose? Is that a term you even use in a bagel <laughs> shop? Right, and, the, and how do you do without that? I mean, I, that's, I think you're, you're, you're getting at a point uh, which is, I think is critical. And for us, like, we've always seen value in, like, repeat customers and also how much every single order has been mm -hmm. and through a few different streams. One is catering. Uh, one is direct-to-consumer 
Yes. Um, and then um, and then delivery. That's been like yes. some of like our three main lines. So for us, it's looking at every time, like each like who the people are coming back, how frequently is it, and what is like the spend per time they come in and like either like order online or come in and get something or ask for catering for their large event. Yeah. And with a product like ours, it's been important to increase those um, transaction. You know, the 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 every transaction pull, value. the yep. pull from each mm -hmm. transaction because. Obviously, if people are just buying bagels, you're not, you're not, you know, you want them to buy the coffee, you want them to add the kombucha, you want them to have a sandwich and take half a dozen home. Oh, and you're taking half a dozen, make sure you take some cream cheese and some, you know, so the upselling is pretty critical. And it's also something where people are perfectly fine not eating that food that you've just made where you are. So if you're going to be doing um, a shop, just keep in mind that like, it's very reasonable culturally for people to take a, a half dozen home and eat it doesn't mean there's anything wrong with it it's just such a mutable or changeable um thing to enjoy in different ways and so customizable that people may not want to they may grab one sandwich to michelle's point but it's you don't expect to like have people like have a full platter of food every time they come yeah so because you know i'm not going to use the example of mcdonald's which is a terrible example but the reality is with mcdonald's it doesn't sell food it sells systems mm-hmm in other words, mm -hmm. you know, another thing I've heard was like, you know, Steven Spielberg said, you know, I, I think it was him that said it, said not only do you love what you're doing, you're going to fall in love with the process of what you're doing. Um, mm. So, you know, for him making a movie, he enjoys the whole process from ideation right through to production and marketing. So uh, because a lot of entrepreneurs certainly get stuck in this fact, I've got a great idea, but then they hate systems and processes and attention to detail which you know um but then you're, you can hire those people they're called accountants quite often and uh, <laughs> yeah and, and you've got to love them uh, one of those accountants is my brother so uh, i've learned to love accountants but um, <laughs> so the reality is is one big challenge being creating good systems and processes to produce a quality product yeah, I think replicability is the most critical thing. I think one thing uh, that's been a barrier to people's thinking, I think in even terms of investment, is that people assume that good bagels can only happen in either New Jersey, where I'm from, New York, or Connecticut. And right. why can you produce all these other baked goods, every other part of the U.S. and the world, consistently delicious? Like what? There's just such a barrier to thinking where I think with the roadshow and our just testing stuff, we've proven that things are replicable using the, the water. Just I, I, like where, where a terroir is for like water, like aguar, I don't know. But like you're able to produce something delicious no matter where you are. So it's between that um, in the past like couple of years, we've done a great job like getting our systems together by getting a consultant to your point, like an operations consultant to help us refine that. Right. But it's <laughs> integral because, you know, yeah. the if it's not the water, it's the process, right? And it's it's a painstaking process. And so it needs to be both a labor of love, but also able to train people on it and to mechanize where you can and to be able to, um, you know, scale even from just our kitchen to a church kitchen to a full-blown, you know, shop. Right. But yeah. So it's, it's obvious to me that uh, you've, you have a real passion for the food industry, uh, a passion for bagels. And I suppose for me, there's two words that I've been playing with recently, which is you ask someone what they're curious about. And I mentioned 10 things they're curious about, right? And then, but then the big question is what compels you? What drives you? Where does that come from? So where do you think your drive and what compels uh, you to, do this bagel business is because it's almost a sense of burning fire that like you know sits within each both of you where does that burning passion come from and does it has it surprised you that's a great question i'm trying to remember robert downey jr's acceptance speech <laughs> Oscars, and he just talked about like his shitty childhood and i think so yeah i feel like i've never really um had comfort or security and i just really had to push myself to do uncomfortable things every week not mm -hmm. have the supports driving forward. So I think there's something to be said about, you know, what hunger means in terms of getting like your needs met and how that's very different than the, the person who's like, has been sated. Right. I mean, am I a little better off than I was when I was a kid? Yeah. But I still, um, you know, like I will rail against Nepo kids. I, I, I have a problem with like people who 
are not mindful of like where they came from. And I feel like the, the, the fire in me is that, but then also knowing that people deserve better products. That's the, that's the, that's the two flames for me. Okay. Yeah. And for me, it's about um, creating space, which I know is a, is a, is a, is a term that's used a lot, especially now as we're trying to all be more inclusive and conscious of bringing people into the fold of things. Um, but you know, my mindset is a community development one. And it's, it's really about creating something that, you know, I always go back to this and it sounds so cliche, but I can remember being a kid in Northern Jersey and going into a bagel shop that has a counter and seeing someone in a business suit, someone in a construction hat, someone in a nursing uh, scrubs. So, you know, and, and to me, that idea of having a space where, um, people, it doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter what you do. You're all eating some version of the same thing that you can customize and have the way that you want it. Um, but that to me is the driving force because when, when, when times get really hard to get the feedback of how much people like the product is one thing, but to see them in line talking to each other, people who may not otherwise ever have a reason to, um, is the part that really fires me up. And, and that's something that it goes to be like being seen and like, you know, mm -hmm. making people feel like more than a transaction, but it's really not even about my immediate connection with them. If I can know that the, that the space and the brand that we've created has a place for you to accidentally bump into somebody like sitting at the bar that you will have a, a memory with, no matter yep. how big or small, that's, yep. that's the piece for me. In other words, seeing community emerge from uh, this environment. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah. Setting the table, Michelle, if you will. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Not literally. And and we could call that the bagel bond. Sure, we could. Oh, my God. All this alliteration is a bit much. I also <laughs> want to apologize. Like, about probably like an hour and a half ago, it's not been that long, I believe Michelle referred to a lettuce as arugula. Just right. for your other audience members, Rocket. I just want to say that out loud. Rocket. Okay, Rocket. right. <laughs> yeah, I wouldn't have got the first word, but I do get the, uh, you know. The oh, well, thank face. you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Let me make sure. Yeah. So um, one question I have is, uh, and it's the dream of many uh, successful restaurants, cafes, and bagel owners, bagel shop owners, is to get, a line out the front that goes like 50 people lining up to get in to get, you know, to fight over bagels because um, it's the best bagel shop in the country. Um, have you achieved that? Have you got a big line that goes out the door and people walk by and go, my God, I've got to go there because uh, there's, it must be popular. It must be great food. Has that happened occasionally or is that a goal? Uh, it has happened uh many times and in many places um i hate waiting in line separately yeah, it's already kind of fucked up that i'm setting the situation up something i would never <laughs> stand in this is what i'm making for people better take a time zone work fast oh, yeah yeah i mean from our first farmer's market to uh many a time at the shop to every location we've been on the road there's always been that snaking line um Fantastic. it's pretty amazing yeah and and we've always been the people to be not one to capture that because we we've always been like oh yeah look at that guy standing outside taking pictures of the line when he should be back there making food you know but there <laughs> <laughs> maybe someday we'll achieve the balance of you know being able we usually take a quick photo before we open when everyone's chomping at the bit to have the doors open just so we can capture it um and that's also with the pop-up you know with the pop-up uh model especially on the road there is that demand yeah which is great fantastic look i'm I think there's the Q lovers and there's the Q haters, right? So, um, and I I gave up snow skiing because I didn't want to queue up. It was too big a line. I gave up snow skiing because I had Qs. Mm -hmm. Yeah. See, yeah. so, yeah, I think that. Now we're really getting to the deep stuff. There's a whole lot next level <laughs> conversation. And, that we could get into the philosophy of Qs and lines, right? So, uh, but. Uh, mm -hmm. And some false Qs. And sometimes people work a little slower or make less food or do whatever to make their lines. I'm not, I'm not conspiratorial. I'm just <laughs> saying you can, you can falsify certain things to make that line happen. People I'm on to you. you. You can. And, uh, that's, and I realize that you are a genuine, you're obviously cooking like 
mad mice trying to create it, the right bagel for everyone, not because you're actually crap at making them or slow at making them. That's the reason not the lines going out the door was because uh, there's this high demand for your bagels, which is um, what I was, I was expecting the answer to be that you were cue makers um, in a really nice way for, for bagels, which is lovely. But uh, I wouldn't line up because I've looked at people that line up for this, the best bread in the world, right, shops, and there's one of those nearby here. And uh, I'm going, Q, sorry, I'm not going Yeah, there. I get it. Right. I get it, for sure. <laughs> yeah, it's... Um... So um, I, is there any tips you would give to, you know, people in the food industry or want to be entrepreneurs or are entrepreneurs, what are some of the top things you've learned as bagel producers and a bagel shop owner What and a food, foodie players, food lovers? What are some of the, is there a few tips you could share with the audience that you think uh, are absolutely key to uh, being successful? And I know what a few of those are for me. It's like, you obviously have persistence, mm -hmm. uh, so what are some of the top tips you'd share with people to succeed at what you do and, and business? Consistency for sure in terms of product. And I would just say like when it comes to getting guidance, I feel like culturally people go to like the, what's it, Gary Vanderchuk or like the people who have like top of the mountain, they've had like 18 X returns, unicorn founders and like star chef, like, you know, so-and-so and so-and-so. Maybe talk to the person who is just like one level above right. where you are or who's someone who's recently achieved like a level past what you have done. They will have a shit ton more in common with you. They might be busier and hard to get a hold of, but they're mm. going to have a lot more practical experience to be able to share with you. Yeah. Yeah. And one of the reasons I think we alluded to it, if I can, we, so we just started um, in sort of this um, interim transitional phase of the business. We started uh, a podcast called Proofing Stage. Um, in this idea of, of this space where you are, you know, practicing kind of equal parts, diligence and patience as an entrepreneur, trying to work the thing to get the best, the best result, but also, um, you know, trying to, to make smart decisions and um, not be as much in the weeds and kind of lift your head up and, and be more strategic. And um, so aligned with that, I would say to recognize that it's a long game. I think, you know, to me, I feel like that's my biggest uh, thing I wish I realized sooner because you can get really caught up, especially as a startup in hustle, 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 bring it, take advantage in it. And it's, and it's exciting. You know, um, we both came from careers where we were mostly salaried, which was fine and stable. But then to go to um, a job where, oh, I can take another, I can take on another event. I can take on, I can keep. I can keep bringing stuff in the door. Um, it has a, a bit of addictive quality to it. And especially when you're scrapping and you're trying to just kind of get your head above water, especially in the beginning, it's really easy to fall into that mentality. Um, but then you don't really take the time early on to put some stuff in place that w would, I think, help. And specifically, as you're talking about those systems and things like that. Yeah. We yeah. got them to a certain level that was kind of good enough, but we, we, I think waited a bit longer than, um, you know, I would have in retrospect to, to, to really put the focus on those things. And I think also in terms of burnout, it's very easy to, um, you, you care about what you're doing. You're passionate about it. You love your customers. You like making your product, but it's very easy to, um, if you're not thinking about it as a long-term, you know, Traction will be there. If you, you have a good project and you've built that, that following and you communicate with people and you, you know, um, respect them, you you can slowly and steadily build it. But um, I feel like a lot of the messaging that we get doesn't necessarily say that, uh, especially when you're just starting out. Yeah. So what's the future for you guys in terms of, uh, you know, bubs? What's where do you see taking it and where would you like to take it? Oof. It's been a tough road since the fall, like um, getting our pitch deck out. Um, shout out to the people of Scroobius for helping us work on um, our wonderful pitch deck. And also shout out to, uh, I won't say the name though, but getting like our video pitches out. It's really been hard to like, um, I, I just, I wish for us to be able to push pack against 
these these questions. What do you call them, Michelle? The questions have for people people have for prevention. Like, all these prevention questions. You know what I mean? Like, uh, we'll just begin to talk to potential investors. We, really need, to, we, we need that for uh, property acquisition and for scaling at this point. People who have knowledge, but also capital, uh, I can see are many years of books and go like, yeah, I, I would like to like bet on this horse. But to come into a meeting with someone, um, even like at an angel level, and then have them uh, push back and say like, oh, Joan, you just told me that you did an event for the Writers Guild Association and you guys um, were really struck by, you know, people's um, you know, lack of food security. Have you thought about making Bub a nonprofit? I, I, I like what? <laughs> Thank I'm you. Sorry, they they were pushing back. WGA is all about people getting like equal, like good, good, fair wages. Or I'll just talk about generally how it's important for us to make sure there's like a good deal of ADA compliance with any shop that we have, because like, even on a good day, I can slip and fall in the kitchen. I can eat crutches the next day and still be helpful, but not as helpful between that and caring about, uh, because we're not from food, right? Not bringing someone into the walk-in and yelling at them. Not mm. having that traditional, very militaristic structure of making a, a restaurant or bakery happen. And to have that, the prevention question again, coming back with people wanting us to be a nonprofit. And I'm just like, we're not going to be hiring people who are tone deaf, uh, ex-arsonists who now learn how to bake. <laughs> like that's not how I want to run a business. So it's it's that I think if I and for your questions, I just want to see past that point where people can just see us for something that'd be a great, you know, CPG product line, bagels, locks, cream cheese, you know, but like like just see past what we're doing here. Envision I'm somebody else and know that there's such a demand for what we're making. Mm. So it's it is a challenge, isn't it? And you, you, I think the food industry is it's got so many moving parts. That's you know, I, I I look at what you guys are doing, and I'm going, oh my god, this is the last thing I want to do, right? <laughs> um, and that's absolutely fine. That's why the world is such a lovely place and a gorgeous place because we've all got different motivations and drives and skills and talents and what we love and hate, and uh, that means we end up producing a whole range of beautiful products called things like bagels. And yeah. uh, I think it's fantastic. And uh, I, I you know, had friends of mine are going, oh, I'm, my dream is to open a coffee shop. Oh, my God. I said, that sounds like a nightmare to me. Yeah. But that's fine. And that's what's lovely about you know, our diversity as humans and um, what's not to love about that. Otherwise, we'd all be just having the same ice cream and it's called vanilla. And it'd be a bit boring, frankly. So... Well I'm going to yeah. ask you one more question, um, oh, which, I ask, which I ask everyone on the show now. It's mm -hmm. what would you do for free if you had all the money in the world that brings you deep joy? And I mean by that not frivolous, but really deep joy. What just makes you glow inside once, you're done, once you've done it or while you're doing it? Love it. Wow. Creative writing. I'd be writing for like probably television or, you know, or marketing other people's businesses. That's a righteously good question. Like if, if you have a fever dream. <laughs> I bet you. <laughs> yeah. You'd be writing like skits. And I'd be writing skits and I'd be parodies and SNL. Oh, yeah. Working for Saturday, Saturday Night Live. SNL. Yeah. Yeah. I, I get that. I've been to Chicago and been to the comedy store, I think. Yeah. And uh, yeah. I watched a, uh, oh, it's, you know, basically the skit where they just, it's random. They just um, mm -hmm. improv. Improv. improv, improv, improvisation. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. yeah. Like, right. Um, I, I think that would be fun. In fact, what we've been doing for the last hour has essentially been improv. <laughs> That's right. That's right. <laughs> That's right. Yes, and yes, and I believe what you, you say, Michelle. Okay. Right. So, Michelle, your answer, please. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, I don't. I don't have a, a well. I mean, honestly, I. It just sounds it sounds staged, but I think I would be doing, um, especially if you know money were not the object. Um, I think I would have a spot. I think I would make our products by hand. I think I would interact with our customers mm -hmm. and have you know it be enough, and not have to feel like I need to work 16 hours to make enough to make money on them the next day. You know what I mean? That type of thing. But I think still this, um, this way of kind of tangibly 
um, making something that people enjoy that creates something outside of me um, and and really like living living that brand um, and living that experience. I think there's uh, whatever I do needs to have some sort of kinetic element. And that's what I love about food. It's what I didn't like about um, my prior career, although I loved a lot of what I did. Um, and something about being um, a small business owner, bringing all of these prior skills together. Mm. Uh, so if you took away the part that makes it the most challenging, which is <laughs> the finances, I think I might just be doing the same thing. Right. Thank you, ladies, for your answers. They're, um, they're yours and they're beautiful. And I think it comes to the sense that I think making a difference by creating. And I think that's what you're both doing. And that's to be applauded and celebrated um, every day. So Thank you for that reflection. What, how, how kind. And also we're pro caper. And I'm glad that you're pro caper as well. Yeah. I appreciate that about you. I'm a caper that loves a caper. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you, ladies. It's been an absolute yeah. joy. I've had a blast. Sure. And, um, what a great way to start my day here in Sydney. Yeah. And uh, it's just gone nine twenty here, and um, it's been it's been a joy. Uh, this brings me joy. These conversations, and um, I can tell seeing hearing your story, um, your experiences, your expertise, your passion that shines through. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Oh, so Time well. to eat. I mean, we talking about. Thank food. you for having us. Yeah, um, we're wrapping up our workday here, but um, really appreciate it. It's a pleasure to to meet and chat. Yeah, thank you very much. Mm -hmm.